This is a Sports Catastrophe production. Hey there, Heather. Ho there. It's Jeff Cutter Diamond. Welcome to another Sports Catastrophe birthday boy. And the birthday boy for today, September the 2nd, is a star American tennis player. It's not Agassi, it's not Sampras, it's not even Courier. He was a great player. He actually had a, the record at the one time of being 160 weeks at top of the rankings. That's, in layman's terms, more than three years consecutively. He had a career total of 268 weeks above everybody else. He still holds some records. He holds 109 singles titles, not just Grand Slams, but normal titles in the Open Era, which started in 1968. Over 1,500 matches played and 1,274 match wins. He's had eight major titles and three year-end championships. He actually won three major titles one year, but was not permitted to participate in the fourth. That could have given him the Grand Slam. Nevertheless, he retired in 1996 at age 43. His name? Jimmy Connors, who is now 72 years old. Connors was born in Belleville, Illinois, and grew up in East St. Louis. East St. Louis? Is there any other St. Louis? <laughs> he would be in his first U.S. championship, the boys under or 11s, when he was 9 years old. And then he was actually coached in Southern California by Pancho Segura. Technically, his mom would also help with his tennis tutelage. He won the Junior Orange Bowl tennis thing at age 12 and 14. One of only nine players to win the title twice in a seven-year history. Connor shocked everyone by being Roy Emerson in a match in Los Angeles at the Pacific Southwest Open. He won the NCAA singles title as a freshman attending UCLA. He would turn pro in 1972 and win the Jacksonville Open. Connors would not want to play in the ATP, the union that was embraced by most professional athletes, because he wanted to play in and dominate a series of similar smaller tournaments organized by his own manager. But he then relented and all of that. Connors was a very dominant player in 1974 and all that. He would play a lot of U.S. Opens and Wimbledons, but not a lot of Australian or French Opens. In Australia, he only played in two. He won in 74, reached his final in 75. And Chocolate didn't want to play in Australia. Although, it must be said that few highly ranked players, aside from Australians, traveled to Australia for that event. I guess because of the travel time and all that. But by the mid-1980s, they would relent and all that. If Connors did more Australian Opens, I think he would have been a bigger star. Regardless of that, he did that. But he also didn't participate in the French Open during his peak years. In 1974, from 1974 to 1978, he didn't participate in the French Open. In 1974, he was banned from playing in the event because of his association with World Team Tennis. You know, that tennis thing that, you know, you put the team ahead of the individual. But then, for four years, he chose not to participate in the French Open. What might have been, if he wasn't associated with World Team Tennis, he probably would have been the Grand Slam champion. Who knows? Regardless of that, Connors is one of 13 men to win three singles, three or more men's singles majors in a calendar year. Connors was dominant in 1974. He only lost four matches in his year and won 15 out of 21 tournaments. He did win the Australian Open, defeating Ken Phil Dent, and then he beat Ken Roswell in both the Wimbledon and U.S. Open finals. And he was trying to become, he could have been the second male in the Open era to hit the Grand Slam, but no, it didn't work. Nevertheless, he did pretty well for himself.
1975, he went to the Wimbledon, U.S. Open, and Australian Open finals, but didn't win any of them. He would win nine tournaments, though. Anyway, Connors captured the U.S. Open in 1976 over Bjorn Borg, and that was his only major. In 1977, Connors was hurt and would lose to Bjorn Borg in the fifth set of Wimbledon and lost the U.S. Open finals to Guillermo Filas. Regardless of that, Connors kept making finals in majors. In 1978, he lost to Con Borg in the final of Wimbledon. However, Connors got Borg back by winning the U.S. Open, played on hardcore for the first time. So, as I said, Connors had the number one ranking on the ATP circuit for 160 weeks. That record was broken by Roger Federer in 2007. But he was still fantastic. Well, he had 160 weeks. But what's funny is he lost his number one ranking for just a week. And then, and then he put up 84 more weeks. So, he had a streak of 244 weeks at number one out of 245. So that was like a five-year stretch. He did quite well making the semifinals and tournaments and all that. In 1982, he shocked everyone by defeating John McEnroe to win Wimbledon. And then he beat Ivan Lendl to win the U.S. Soul Prince, getting his number one ranking back. <clears throat> it was basically McEnroe and Connors fighting for number one and all that. Connors would win the U.S. Open for a record fifth time, defeating Lendl in the final. So he looked pretty good. He had a lot of rivalries. Bjorn Borg, Julian Assassi, Guillermo Filas, Rod Laver, John Newcomb, and all that. And, of course, McEnroe. Who can forget about McEnroe? I mean, it was just a great matchup with him. Connors would actually make the final... Of Wimbledon in 1984 with semi final appearances at the French Open, US Open, and the Masters Cup. Connors had basically lost his touch in 87. However, four years later, he put up one of the greatest comebacks around for any athlete when, at the age of 39, he shocked everyone by making the semi finals of the US Open in 1991. So, yeah, Connors and Macro were a great matchup, too. All that. So, regardless of that, it was just amazing and all that. So, Connors was in as a wild card. His first match was against Patrick McEnroe, John's brother. And McEnroe actually won the first two sets, but Connors somehow won the next three. And then he took on a Dutch qualifier, Shapers, beating him in straight sets. Then the number 10 seed, Karl Novacek from Czechia, was swept away by Connors. And then he beat Aaron Krikstein on his 39th birthday, no less, in a famous five-setter that had a couple of long tie breaks. And then I believe that was the match which Connors made that sound bite. I'm busting my hump at 39 and you pull stuff like that. Very clear in my butt. That got him to the quarterfinals against another Dutchman, Paul Harhoys, where he beat him in four sets. And then in the semis, he faced Jim Currier, the number four seed, and lost three straight sets. But I mean, dude, for Jimmy Connors to make the semifinals as a wild card, no less, in a major, that's just amazing. Edberg would win the tournament. Anyway, yeah. Connors would participate in his last major in 92 U.S. Open. He won the first round, but lost to Ivan Lendl in the second round. Anyway, he kept playing and all that. He got to the quarterfinals of a, of a tournament in Germany in June 1995, but lost to Mark Rosette. His last official ATP match was to Ricky Rinberg. Of course, there would be a lot of troubles for World Team Tennis and all that.
So yeah, that was just what happened and all that. He's had a lot of distinctions. He's won 109 women's singles titles for tournaments and all that. Not even Federer or Nadal or Djokovic have done that. He even won 16 doubles titles as a guy. Anyway, he did quite well. He had 398 tournaments played, which was the record until Fabrice Santaro broke it in 2008. In Grand Slam singles, he reached the semifinals at least 31 times, despite the fact that he only went to Australia twice and didn't even enter the French Open for five years. That's just amazing what he could do and all that. He had a great playing style in the racket evolution and all that. He did commentary with NBC in 1990 and 91, despite the fact he was still an active player. He would commentate for the BBC for a few years in the 2000s. And Connors has served as a commentator and analyst for Tennis Channel since the 2009 US Open. He even was a coach at one time, coaching Andy Roddick. It was a 19-month relationship that saw Roddick make one major final, and that was the U.S. Open losing to Federer. Sharapova would only partner with Connors for one match, and Jeannie Bouchard partnered with Connors for a little bit. Anyway, Connors was engaged to fellow tennis pro Chris Everett for a couple of years. And they both won the singles at 1974 Wimbledon, which meant that they were the love for double. But unfortunately, the engagement was broken up before the 75 Wimbledon championship. They both reconciled, but it didn't work and all that. Connor said that Everett was actually pregnant and had an abortion, but it was never proven. He was engaged to a Miss World for a couple of years, but didn't do it but married a Playboy model, having two children and live in Santa Barbara. Connors actually auditioned for the daytime version of Wheel of Fortune. Yes, once upon a time, there was a daytime version of Wheel of Fortune and not the nighttime version of Pat Sajak. Unfortunately, he lost the daytime version to Rolf Benershka, former Chargers kicker. Anyway, he did all that. Anyway, um, Connors actually was on a episode of Family Guy called Christmas is Coming. I didn't know that. That didn't make sense. Well, regardless of that, Jimmy Connors would win. tournaments. 1974, he was the Australian Wimbledon and U.S. Open champion. French Open, he couldn't compete in because of the World Team Tennis thing. He won U.S. Open 76. He won the U.S. Open 78. He won the Wimbledon and U.S. Open in 82. 83, he won the U.S. Open. So those were all his men's singles titles and all that. So, anyway. He actually is one of five people to actually, in the Australian Open, win the title on their first attempt at the at the Grand Slam. Well, the Australian Grand Slam. He he is the same as Roscoe Tanner, Fidesz, Curious, Yoan Craig. Yoan Craig did that? Didn't know that. And Andre Agassi. He would win five U.S. Opens. He still holds that record, tying Pete Sampras and Roger Federer. And he made 12 consecutive semifinals in the U.S. Open. Not even Federer or Djokovic or Nadal have done that. So that's just unbelievable. He stands alone for most titles on her nine career indoor titles and a lot of things. So yeah, Jimmy Connors was the epitome of things. Maybe he did have a temper like McEnroe, but he was smooth sailing. And could have been a Grand Slam champion. He could have won. He could have won the Grand. He would have swept the Grand Slams in '74. But things happen. Anyway, I'm Jeff. I'm gonna do.